because I'm a serious scientist, they would not let me up here until I promised not to bore you to tears with an endless parade of charts and graphs. So, let's talk about the ocean. Most people view the ocean as boundless, as unlikely to be affected by human activities. Most scientists, though, view the ocean as the place where rampant fishing, where too many boats are chasing too few fish. They view the ocean as a place where rampant intensive fishing, now penetrating to every nook and cranny of the deep, threatens both by, to disrupt the fabric of ocean ecosystems and also to, dis, to displace the bounty that we currently enjoy to help feed the hungry people of the world. I look at it a little bit different, though. I look at the ocean fisheries, the ocean fishing around the world, as an underperforming asset, um, held back, held in chain, held in check by obsolete management methods that squander up to $50 billion a year in potential income and massive amounts of food to help feed those same people. So, the, um, the ocean is a complicated place and the, uh, the, the threats to the ocean are broad. Um, it, does, it doesn't have to be that way. There, if we can replace those failing management mechanisms with alternatives that work, then we can restore the natural replenishment power of the ocean and protect it for now and for generations to come. Today, I'm going to focus on what I believe to be the most exciting of those new alternative methods. But first, a little bit of background and a little bit of perspective. Now, I lied. There is one slide. <laughs> if you go back to the 1960s, ocean scientists felt that the, the ocean could support more than 10 times more fish than was being harvested at that time. The world fishing fleet expanded, the power built, the number of fish landed increased, but it never got anywhere close to the amount, that amount. It peaked in about 1990 at not even twice what was being harvested back in the 1960s. Now that's a, and UN experts looking at projecting the future believe now that stagnating ocean wild fisheries are the best we can hope for going out to 2030. But the world population is continuing to increase, which means that per capita, each person then gets a lot less. And so this chart shows what each person in the world would get from wild harvested fish going into the future. The answer is by about 2030, that number will have come down by about 40% and from there, it continues in the wrong direction. In order to understand this problem and the solutions, you need to look at it through the eyes of the fishermen. This is Buddy Gwendon, who is a longtime, lifelong commercial fisherman in Galveston, Texas. Some would say irascible. I would say lovable. Uh, Buddy has fished red snapper and grouper in the Gulf of Mexico forever. And his experience is in many ways typical. As more, as fish prices go up, more fishermen want to fish for them. More fishermen means more competition. More competition means more boats, bigger boats, more powerful boats, faster boats. That induces a race among fishermen to get to the fish the first. The managers go, oh no, and try to limit fishermen's access to fish by putting in place more and more regulations and caps on the amount of fish that can be taken. One of the things they like to do is to shorten the season in which fishermen can go get fish. What does that make fishermen do? Go get bigger, faster boats, race harder, right? And on and on in a vicious cycle that ends up crashing populations and not rewarding fishermen. 
By the early 2000s, the red snapper population in the Gulf of Mexico was down to a few percent of where it started. And the season, the open season for fish, was down to not much more than a month. Now what that means is that a whole year's worth of fish comes to the dock at the same time, a glut results, and the price per pound is low. Red snapper was in the crappa, if you will ex excuse my, my French. It's also dangerous to go out when the season is open, regardless of the weather, regardless even of profit. There had to be a better way. And so a few enlightened fishermen, some scientists, some economists started looking around the world at lessons that could be harvested and they found in unlikely far-flung places like Iceland and New Zealand and South Africa a different way to think about this, a way that we have come to call cat shares. Cat shares works different than traditional management. What if instead of making a big pile of regulations and letting fishermen outsmart you to get more than you think they're going to, you told each fisherman or each fishing family or each fishing community how much fish they could have in the course of the year. Then they can plan their business. They don't need to race for that fish. They can time the harvest to match the market and make the most they can per pound of fish that's allowable scientifically. That's really pretty cool, isn't it? But it's even better if Instead of making it an amount, you make it a proportion. Think about a piece of the pie that gets bigger as the whole pie gets bigger, right? Now that creates an incentive for fishermen not to outsmart the managers, but actually to become stewards to help the managers do their jobs in partnership to make the pie bigger to grow their own asset. And in fact, it works that way. But Buddy, hearing about catch shares coming maybe into the Gulf said, hell no, he voted no. But it turned out that 80% of red snapper fishermen in the Gulf knew that traditional management was failing and that more needed to be done. They said, hell yes. It went on the water in 2007. Today, today, the red snapper population in the Gulf of Mexico is three times what it was in 2006. Buddy fishes year-round. He and all of his fellow fishermen comply completely with science-based catch limits. Buddy is making way more money today. The, the program has spread. There are 14 species of reef fishes, groupers and things now, that are managed under that program. It's spreading rapidly around the United States. In fact, Last year, in the Pacific Coast fisheries in the United States, 70 million meals of high-quality, sustainable seafood came from catch share fisheries in just that fishery. In New England, even the, the, the hardest, the hairballest, is that a word? The hairballest of, of all American fisheries have now adopted this program to manage cod and haddock and things like that. In all, two-thirds of U.S. Offshore commercial fisheries are now harvested using catch shares. In the United States, truly the tide has turned. Now what about, what about other places in the world? Because it turns out that the secret sauce is not necessarily the, exactly what's happened in the Gulf of Mexico or New England or anywhere else, but rather the fact that one can create secure access to a, for a fisherman, for a fishing family, for a fishing community, and they can use that to plan their future. So whether you're in Belize or Indonesia or Namibia or Sweden, there are fishermen now cooperating, working with managers in order to put in place high quality, rights-based, incentive-based fishery management systems that work for them in their society and in their culture. That's happening, the spread is occurring. How would that world fishery picture change? The one I told you about at the beginning, the, the, the death spiral to hell for, for fish. How would that change if catch shares, if rights-based fisheries management became the norm at the global scale? Well, we're on the cusp of finding out a group of economists and scientists from the University of California, Santa Barbara, the University of Washington and others um, have, have compiled the world's biggest database of fisheries, these little chunks of fish and fishermen in, in a certain place. 
We've built on top of that database a complicated biological model and a complicated economic model that lets you play all kinds of what-if games, and we have done that. Now, I can't give you the chapter and verse on it because it hasn't finished being peer-reviewed and all of that, although I'll say, watch in your paper for the news in late winter or early spring when this comes out because it's going to blow some, blow some people's mind. The answer is not that it, this has to be a, uh, an impossible choice between fish and fishermen or fishing families. That's not what it is. The answer is that there's this unbelievable win-win-win opportunity to put more fish in the water, maybe as many as 50% or even 100% more. At the same time, we're pulling up to 50% more fish out of the water, and at the same time, we're expanding the value of that fish by 100% or maybe even much more, a true win-win when opportunity. This, uh, this, altern this vision really excites me. I think it is um, totally possible to expect for this to happen. There's, no, there's every reason to expect that it will, that we'll be able to look into the future and see a, a vibrant and life-filled sea that uh, that has all con and high quality marine ecosystems and wildlife and, and uh, fishing communities healthier and more prosperous. But that's only the case because what is good for fish is also good for fishing families. And that's, a, that's a really, really important thing. I think as important as that is that the momentum is building, as I told you a minute ago. And we can expect this to happen in our lifetimes. That's unprecedented. It, to me, it's personally exciting, both because of what I do for a living. I'm a paid environmental advocate. Yeah, a nerd scientist, but a paid environmental advocate. But I'm also excited about this for totally personal reasons. I grew up with lots, spending lots of time at the beach by the shore, on the water, under the water. In fact, that's me looking over the shoulder of a 400-pound Goliath grouper. I want my now nine-month-old granddaughter, Julia, who lives in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, to be able to experience the things that I did growing up on the beach, on the coast, on the boats, and in the water. I want her daughter, when she is able to strap on her fins, her mask, her scuba tank, 40 years out into the future, to be able to go and see things like that. That excites me. I hope it excites you, because this won't happen until you become part of the equation. Uh, today, today, only 8% of the world's fishery is managed with cat shares. What we've been able to do is look at what a strategy would look like that might actually flip the whole global fishing system. And it turns out that if only 12 more countries, the fishermen there, the government officials there, the politicians there agree, then those 12 countries with the ones already in the fold could achieve fully 70% of the entire world fishery in high quality rights-based fisheries management. And that's truly exciting. To get there requires the support of the people. I can't do it alone. I can't do it with them. I also need you. You can make a difference. Adopt this vision, make it part of your own. Learn about where your seafood comes from at home. When you go into the store, carry a sustainable seafood collect selector card and buy things that are on the green end of the spectrum, please. Vote with your wallet. I think you might be surprised just how much difference we together can make especially if it's not just us, but tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of Americans 
millions of people around the world banding together so that we can look forward into the future and see, again, a shining sea. Thank you.